Thank you, everyone. Um, hi, I'm Radhika. Uh, I would like to talk to you about how to make a mini brain tissue in a dish. So to do this, I will go back a few, maybe 100 years, uh, and talk about this Spanish neuroscientist called Santiago Ramón y Cajal. He is uh, widely known to be the father of neuroscience. And apart from making some really beautiful uh, drawings of the, the cells that make up the brain, he also came up with some really nice philosophies. So he said that as long as our brain is a mystery, the universe, the reflection of the structure of the brain, will also be a mystery. Now that's a really romantic thought, especially for somebody who wants to study the human brain. And uh, me and other neuroscientists, and there are many other people who would like to do this. How do we do this? How can we learn how the brain works? Now, um, usually, you can determine the function of something by looking at the structure of what it's, what it's made of, what it's composed of. So you can open it up and look inside. Can we do this with the human brain? Uh, it's possible. You can get some brain tissue, but this is really difficult. And uh, human brain tissue is limited uh, in availability. So what do we do? <laughs> yeah, that was not a joke, but it happened to be a joke. But anyway. <laughs> So we go back to the philosophies of uh, Ramon y Cajal. And again, 100 years ago, he said that any man could, if he was so inclined, be the sculptor of his own brain. Now, to be fair, I think he said this more uh, in the context of brain plasticity and how it's adaptable. But I think uh, a lot of people try to look at it as, why not start from the scratch? OK, we cannot open up a human brain. Let's start making it from scratch, bottom up. So can you do a do-it-yourself brain? This actually exists, by the way. There's a Lego brain, skull, kidney kind of puzzles. And uh, so this is sort of the premise. This is what neuroscientists are trying to do. And uh, what they're trying to do is make a brain from the beginning. So like trying to put it together like a puzzle, like a Lego puzzle. So what are the Lego blocks here? What are the building blocks? So we start with something known as human stem cells, which I will talk about a bit more in detail. And um, these are the building blocks of what will finally become the brain. So think of it like this now. You actually have a system where you can follow these building blocks or human stem cells and build a tissue, really, cell to cell, block to block. So that's really amazing, and that's something which has not been done before. So to start with this, I have to go back to the basics a little bit uh, to introduce you to some concepts and how we started. So what are human stem cells? So these are a bunch of cells which have two functions. One is to self-renew. They constantly keep making more of themselves. And second is to give rise to all different types of cells in the human body. So they can give rise to brain cells, skin cells, muscle cells, what you may. Now, where, how do we get these cells? Um, and also, how, we, how do we start? Like, How do these cells come into existence? So we start as a fertilized egg. This is when an egg and a sperm come together. This is a zygote, and this is a, a, how all of us start. And we go through many cell divisions. We are then two cells, then four cells, and 16 cells, and finally a bunch of 100 cells. And this is a very important sta uh, stage, I must say. I mean, you go on to become an adult or a, uh, a baby. But uh, this stage is very important also for scientists, because this is the stage where you can get stem cells. This is the stage where you can get cells, which can then become any other cell type in the body. So of course, scientists realized this, and they used cells from the aborted fetuses. So you could get these cells, which are uh, then becoming the stem cells that we can grow in a dish in the lab. You can just uh, isolate them, and you can grow them in the dish. And these cells in the lab also, just like in the human uh, embryo, they give rise to many different types of cells. These cells then organize to become tissues, and tissues become organs, and organs become a human body. This is great, but of course, this is coming from an aborted fetus, so there is a lot of ethical issues around it. It's not something that scientists can do very freely or um, easily. Is there a better way to get these stem cells so that we can sleep better at night and at lab? So once again, textbook knowledge, human stem cells give rise to all of these specific human cell types. These give rise to a human body. Now, this is what we know, and we know that these, uh, these cells stay as they are. So if you are a blood cell, you are a blood cell forever. But now came uh, a Japanese scientist, Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize, and he told us, no, this is not the case. You can change the identity of a cell, which again is a, an amazing discovery in my eyes, because 
imagine that you can take a blood cell or a skin cell and then add a few factors, mumbo jumbo magic, and then you can make them stem cells again. So this is really like the curious case of Benjamin Button for those of you who have seen the movie. You can really take an adult cell, put it back into an embryonic stage and that's amazing because now you have a system in the lab without having to get embryos or fetuses which you can then use to make any kind of cell which is what happens in the body so this is great so now that we are equipped with this knowledge that we can make human induced stem cells they are just called induced they are the same as the stem cells from the human but they are called induced because we get them from a different bunch of cells so now that we know this we can now go ahead and look at the recipe for making mini brain, brain tissue in a dish it does seem like a lot of voodoo, to be honest. The first time I read it, I'm like, uh, I'm, I can't do this. Like, what is this? How did people come up with it? And it's really pretty cool because the, the scientist, there's a Japanese scientist, Yoshiki Sasai, and two scientists who are currently in Austria, Madeleine Lancaster and Jürgen, uh, Jürgen Noblisch, who came up with this so-called cocktail or the mechanisms or a perfect protocol to make mini brains in a dish. So let me run you through this. This is their work, and I would like to simplify this the best I can. So there are some things that you need, of course. So the first thing is a cell and tissue growth medium. So think of it like an energy drink, that the ones that we drink, like Red Bull or something, which has many supplements, and uh, these help the cells to grow and uh, reproduce. And then there are um, growth factors for specific parts. So you can really take some supplements to augment certain uh, parts which you want. Uh, sorry. And then, of course, infrastructure. You need to do this in a lab. This is not something you should try at home. So, okay, how do we start? Like I said, we have these stem cells, and these uh, stem cells are usually, they are stuck to the dish. That's how they grow, they are attached to the dish. So think of them as a bunch of people who are sitting in a bar, they're sitting, they are relaxed, they're drinking beer, and they're sitting. So now, how about we remove them? So if we remove these cells from the dish, what do they do? They automatically, they come together, they clump up. Just like people, if you ask them to stand up, if I asked you all to stand up now, you will automatically form groups to people you like or you make interactions with. That's exactly what these cells are doing. They, once they are apart from the dish, they start talking to each other, they have interactions, and they come together and they form a group or a ball of cells. To this, we now add all the energy drink, which has the nutrients, we add the growth factors, and then it becomes a, a well-organized ball of cells. Okay. So now it has some sort of organization and it's growing. We need to make it grow further. And uh, to do this, we try to mimic the way it grows within a human brain. So we try to give it some sort of a structure or a scaffold so it can grow better. And you can imagine this as jello shots. I guess everybody's done jello shots. So if you put like a cherry or a plum or an apple into, gel into the jelly, it can set and it really, uh, it's exactly what we're doing. We put these bunch of cells into a jelly-like substance, a hydrogel and we let them grow further. So this helps them get nutrition and it also helps them grow better. So now they grow and they become even bigger floating balls and then finally they become this, which is what I call the mini brain balls. And uh, they grow up to a size of up to three to five millimeters. And this entire protocol from day zero to the day we get this is approximately a month. Of course, you can keep them in culture longer. In the lab, we also keep it for up to four to six months. And uh, there are labs who also keep it for up to a year, so they grow and mature much more. So this is what they look like, live in action. It's slightly skewed, the video. I'm not great at doing this video stuff. I can grow these th things, but I can't take videos of it. So this is what it looks like. Uh, so now, of course, now that I've shown you what it looks like and how they're made, you'll be like, uh, this is not a human brain. Yes, of course, it's not a human brain. So again, to, I have to introduce this and as a cautionary approach that I need to explain what there is a difference between an organ and an organoid, like there's a reason why they are called organoids. So this is the scientific term for mini brains, they're called brain organoids. There have been, of course, not just with the brain, uh, people have been curious and they've made mini organs of many other organs. So there are mini hearts, mini kidneys, mini eyes. Uh, there is a boom in this industry. Yeah. So um, to just to uh, bring home this message, uh, an organoid or a mini organ is basically a miniature and a simplified version of an organ. It is produced in vitro, vitro is glass, so in the lab. And of course it's three-dimensional, so it, it is useful, it's much more useful than a two-dimensional culture. 
and it shows the microstructure of the organ that you're trying to mimic. And since I'm interested in this and we are talking about this, just another picture of these brain organoids. So once again, they always, so a brain organoid is a mini brain. This is what we're referring to here. All right, so how do we know that this is really a good system? We need to, what are the similarities between a mini brain or an organoid and an actual human brain? So there are many similarities. I'm just going to t touch upon a few. So this is uh, an image of a section of the human brain, and this is an image of a section of an organoid. You don't need to worry about the colors or whatever, but I think anybody who looks at this can see that the structure, the way the colors are organized are very similar in both of them, which goes to show that these colors basically represent some proteins which are marking these, uh, these structures. And these proteins are very similar, or the uh, components of these both structures are very similar in the human brain and the human organoids. And there is a lot of data with respect to genetic, genetics, which is also similar, and uh, the timeline of development and the kinds of cells produced. So basically, they're very similar to the human brain in its embryonic development. So of course, if we study the function of something, it helps us study the dysfunction of, the, of this organ or the structure. So to study the dysfunction of the human brain, there have been many different ways to do this. So uh, uh, absolutely uh, worth a mention is animal models. There is no way that we can get anywhere in neuroscience if we didn't have animal models. And uh, then people started using some 2D culture models where they took cells from the human brain and tried to culture it. And this is a bit difficult and it's possible, but of course it, it's not as um, knowledgeable. Uh, it doesn't give as much knowledge as um, more in vitro or in vivo systems. And then now we have arrived at the 3D culture models, which is what I'm talking about, the mini organoids, the mini brains. So here we really, until now, like I said, we've always been uh, studying a um, human disease or human neurological disease in the in a mouse model or a primate model. But now we have this unique technique where we can study human brain diseases in a uniquely human system. And of course, since we can do that, we can also reduce the number of animal experiments. We cannot do away with it, of course, but we can reduce them, which is great. Uh, so I would like to give you some examples of how human brain diseases are being studied with, with these mini brains. So just one of the many examples is, um, I guess you've heard of uh, the Zika virus, which caused a lot of uh, problems in Brazil, in Asia, and Africa. Um, this is a virus that infects uh, cells within the embryo, so in a pregnant woman, and uh, it causes neurological damage and uh, even death. So what people have now done is use the Zika virus and they have infected um, mini brains with the Zika virus. And what they found out was that there is a specific kind of cell which is damaged uh, because of this. Uh, this uh, virus infects a certain kind of cell. And uh, they also found that in one of the um, symptoms of this disease is that you have a smaller brain, so microcephaly compared to a normal head. So the children have smaller head sizes and they also could show this with the organoids. So what they did was they made these mini brains and they, with the, they took cells from the patient and they, sh sh uh, they saw that the mini brains were even more mini. So they could really actually recapitulate what was happening in the human brain and also study a very human specific mechanism to see that there are certain kinds of cells which are uh, killed specifically by the Zika virus, which is really good for if you want to try out therapy to know these kinds of cells. And also they found out that there, there were some DNA damages, etc. So. This is obviously a very useful technology to study something specifically human. And just to give you an idea, there are many other diseases like Alzheimer's, brain tumors, schizophrenia, etc., which are currently being studied with, these, with this technology. And this is also to emphasize the fact that the rise of the organoids, it sort of happened around 2012, 2013, and already by within five years, there's a lot of data with respect to a lot of diseases. So what is the future of this technology? Of course, people are trying to do some more cool stuff with it. And since I spoke about disease modeling and studying of um, human diseases, what people are also now doing is that they can actually now put uh, these small structures onto chips and they can do drug testing. So they, you can really put uh, the, the brain organoids from a, a normal person and a patient and you can compare how the drug works on both of them. So this is really cool. This is stuff which is happening in some companies, also in universities. And uh, people are also trying to do some other cool stuff where they try to put make two different types of brain tissue. So brain tissue from maybe a, the right side of the brain or the left side of the brain, and they try to put it together and see how they interact with each other. This is, again, something which is pretty awesome. 
but yes, uh, okay, this is a slide full of references, just, uh, just saying. I love Shakespeare and I have to mention him somewhere. Um, as scientists, we have to always call a spade a spade. It's really important to not oversell what we are doing. We're not making a human brain. So when I keep using these, this word mini brains, it's something I do to make it easier for everyone to understand. But I don't know if anybody knows this. This is a, a really cool movie, watch it. It's called Princess Bride. Princess Bride, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we have to be very cautious when we use this word. Because, just to give you an example, this is a fly brain, this is a mouse brain, and this is a human brain. Where are we now? We are somewhere here with the organoids. Just to highlight this point. But we can make it better. Of course, every technology, I mean, this is really, this technology is in its infancy. It has just been born. So can you imagine what can be done with this? One of the things which is being already done is that, so if you have seen the structure of a human brain, if you just go back here, you see that they have all these folds and, you know, these, uh, it's a very peculiar structure. And this is, you don't see that in the mini brain organoid. So what people are now doing is really doing a lot of experiments to make this a more folded structure, which is really more authentic, so to say. And what they're also doing is, right now, uh, trying to put some other cell types, like there are cells in the brain which are called glial cells, or the cells that keep the other the neurons together, which also have a lot of functions, and the blood cells, so they're really trying to make it more complete in terms of a uh, brain tissue. So what motivates us? Just to come to the end, I think, so there are a lot of different uh, theories to how to interpret this painting, and I think Michelangelo was trying to for me, he was trying to show a human brain here. There are many other um, theories, of course, but of course, as a neuroscientist, I see a human brain here. And I feel that it's really, uh, really important that stem cell biologists and neuroscientists coming together can really give rise to what I call the creation of the perfect organoid. So uh, these, OK, yeah, by the way, these are the organoiders, I would say. So this is Marisa Karu. I work with her. And this is Benedict. Unfortunately, he didn't come to the school event, so we don't have a picture with him. But uh, we work here at the LMU, at the Biomedical Center in Martins Reed. And you can always drop by if you want to have a chat or ask any questions or see some organoids. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much. Very interesting. I love the idea of floating mini brain balls. <laughs> I think someone's used it as an insult to me on more than one occasion. Um, <laughs> throw the floor open to any questions, please. There's a hand shot at the very, very back. Was the first. Uh, so my question is, uh, like, the effect of any pathogen or a virus on a separate organ, mini organ, ca can we say that it's the same as uh, part of the of, uh, of an organ uh, which is part of the body? No, we can't say that, and I don't claim it. Of course, you're studying something in isolation. This is one of the biggest limitations of having in vitro cultures or anything which you're doing in the lab because you, you cannot get, I mean, the same kind of results that you do when you study something which is a complete functioning human being or a complete functioning organism. But considering that we don't have another option to do this in, this is really the best we can do right now. Okay, thank you. Next question over here. Um, is it possible, or do people aim to work the function or the processing <coughs> of the brain? Like, do they investigate like the behavior or learning in this meaning? Okay, so the question is, do, do people try and investigate <laughs> brain behavioralism in the organelles? I would say the technology is quite naive right now for this kind of uh, application. So first of all, yes, these structures do have connections. So they do make electrochemical connections. There are the, the unit that builds the brain. So there are neurons inside them, and they do fire action potential. So they, they talk to each other. There are connections. But it's you have to still remember that it's a 5 millimeter size tissue. It's really small. And it does not have all the connections that is required to what you are saying, you know, to study behavior or, you know, consciousness, or et cetera. It's really far away from that, really far. OK, yeah. thank you. Another sir? What, what is the growth factor? Uh, we, we can you get it to induce the cell to be a uh, mini brain? OK, so where, where, from where do we get these growth factors that make the stem cells turn into brain cells? There are many different growth factors, and uh, it really depends on the kind of um, brain structure that you want. So for example, if you need uh, in the beginning, you have to give them a certain set of growth factors which are common, 
So you give them things like uh, BDNF, GDNF, which is like brain-derived no, uh, neural growth factor. And there are different, uh, I don't know, I can name these things, but um, the after which you have to give them more specific growth factors, depending on what kind of brain region you're looking for. There are people who make like hippocampal organoids, uh, a very specific region of the brain, or midbrain organoids, or hindbrain organoids. So then, depending on that, you have to give them different factors. Is it diffi difficult to, uh, to get them, this growth factor? They're not, it's not difficult, they're kind of expensive, but yeah, it's not <laughs> difficult. <laughs> as long as it's known what the growth factor is, yeah, you can get them, yeah. In a lab environment, yes. You can get anything yeah. with money, yeah? This <laughs> <laughs> question here? Um, to your opinion, or to your kind of knowledge, knowledge yeah. does it require more than growth factors to make a functioning brain that is able to process information? So do we need more than just growth factors to make this thing work? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think this, I, I mean, I, I had this on a slide, but I think it's very important to know that to make this tiny five millimeter structure, you need, uh, you need to know neuroscience, you need to know stem cell biology, you need to know biophysics, you need to know the material, material science because there's so much dependent on the kind of dish that it grows in. You need to really understand a lot of these uh, sciences to make something even as small as that. So it's not just addition of growth factors or giving them whatever energy drinks. There's really how these cells interact with each other. I mean, of course, I haven't sat, sat and done all this. This has all been done by scientists before. And I think it's really important to, to emphasize the fact that it's really a, so many different sciences coming together to be able to make such a small system even. So you have to understand many different aspects of it, how these cells interact, how they interact with the dish, how they interact with each other and many other things like that. Okay, thank you. I think one last question, then we'll have our break. A small question. Um, are there any other applications of, of these uh, organoids, for example, like s using it as a computing power in, uh, in robotics? <laughs> or <laughs> <laughs> the question is, can, can we use the organoids in anything else in robotics? For example, or? developing consciousness. I don't know if you see any application in like near future uh, developing consciousness or artificial intelligence using these yeah. organoids. Oh, okay. Go for it. I would say it's kind of like the answer would be similar to her, uh, the answer to her question, because I don't think the organoids are there yet to be able to study something so complicated as consciousness. I mean, we don't even know what consciousness is with the human brain completely in its you know, full capacity. So I think that's really, really naive at this point. But maybe, yes, there's a point where you can really mix computational uh, systems and uh, stem cell biology and some get somewhere close. But I th right now, it's really difficult to, un unless you really get a structure which is so complete, it's very difficult to study behavior and consciousness. We are really looking at this system as something which you can study very early stages, like very early stages of growth when the embryo is developing. And there's so many diseases which happen during that stage which cannot be studied really well. And the system helps more for this rather than for studying something like consciousness. To, my, to the best of my knowledge, and of course, maybe there are many people working on this right now. So, okay, great. What I know. So, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you.